Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Unfiltered Author Talks. And tonight we are really, really excited to bring you Jim Rosebrock, who has authored one of the coolest, most unique, awesome studies done of the Antietam battlefield, and that is the artillery at Antietam. Jim, thank you for joining us tonight. We are really happy to have you, man. Tyler, thanks for having me. I Absolutely. And if uh, anybody forget, we're going to do quick introductions. I have Darren over here on my left. On my right is Jay with a circle. He doesn't actually have a face. It's just a circle with a J. Um, <laughs> we have Jim beneath me and then the illustrious Anthony Trousseau, or I like to call him Tony DeRusso. Or Patrick. Or, or Patrick or Rudy. There's a lot of names you could call him, but Anthony's his real name, so get it. No. Anyways, without any further ado, I want to go ahead and get us started here. So the elevator music will go off and we will start our show. So, Jim, uh, I think I told you a little bit how this works before we got into it. It's basically a free-flowing conversation. Imagine yourself at a bar with a beer and we're talking history and talking about this wonderful book that you have provided us here. Um, I have a copy here in case anyone does not know what it looks like. It is, is it here? It is awesome. The Antietam Institute has put out brigades of Antietam and now artillery of Antietam. James put out in this, again, if you're anything like me and you love the artillery, this is the book to go to. Uh, but Jim, let's talk about... How a little bit about you. Introduce yourself. Tell us about yourself and how this came to be. Well, uh, I am uh, uh, an Antietam Battlefield guide. I've been there for about 17 years. Started out as a volunteer. Uh, was the head guide from about 2011 to about 2018. Uh, worked for, I'm retired from the Army, retired Lieutenant Colonel, was in 28 years active in reserves, and then worked for the Department of Justice and retired from that organization two years ago. Uh, when the Institute was organized, you know, the first book we came up with was Brigades of Antietam. Um, and we initially thought that we could get artillery squeezed into that book uh, as well. But if you know how big the Brigades book was uh, and how big the artillery book is, uh, we decided to basically say do, make this, the artillery a second book. So yeah. uh, I... The, uh, the Brigades book was a, was a combination of a number of guys. If you've read the book, you're familiar with that. Guides, rangers, uh, uh, volunteers, some as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I, I wanted to uh, take a swing at writing the, the, the entire book. I was, I was just interested in that. Right. You know, if you know anything about artillery books, Gettysburg's got about 10 books on artillery. <laughs> no, there's that G word again. <laughs> yeah, I, had to, I had to get that. Oh, good. But the uh, uh, if you're the only book that ever was done on Antietam was Artillery Hell. It's a mm -hmm. And I saw that book. up there. Yeah, it's, it's about 1980, 1992, 93. It's really more a catalog. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a little it's a catalog. The, the who, what, when, where of each battery. And uh, so I, I thought it was time that we spent some time with the artillery. And, and I wanted to cover not only the history of the battle, the artillery at the battle, uh, but also some background on each battery. Uh, I think we have 115 batteries featured in the book. Yeah. And we take them back to when they were organized, who the commanding officers were, a little bit of history about them before Antietam, and then a real in-depth treatment of what, what they did at Antietam. It's not a book that you sit down and read cover to cover. It, that, that may be down the road some way, but this is a more, in some ways, more of a reference book. If you're interested in the Washington Artillery from New Orleans, you can go right to that chapter and read about them. Or, you know, any, any one of, of the batteries, uh, you can do it that way. But there's also a couple of interesting appendices in there that cover uh, tables that roll up all the artillery. Uh, did some analysis of... Uh, the field grade artillery leadership at Antietam. And also uh, there was a rarely seen letter that Henry Hunt wrote, I believe on September 12th to his artillery chiefs, basically laying out his thought processes, his ideas on how to successfully fight artillery. So that's all in the book. And awesome. I hope it, I hope it uh, adds to the scholarship of Antietam, but more specifically to the, level of knowledge we have on those artillery guys there were ten thousand cannoneers there ten thousand uh thousand significant number wow yeah 
We have some uh, folks on Facebook commenting in. Uh, Andrea Quinn says, good evening from Swaggy Rockport, Massachusetts. Um, and you mentioned Artillery Hell. This uh, gentleman, Rhett Dakota, said that Artillery Hell is a great book. And then Gwendolyn says hello from Frederick, Maryland. So we have another Maryland girl on one of our, our antique podcasts today. Awesome, awesome. Great. So what Swaggy got Rockport interested? might be the farthest I've seen on these podcasts. Yeah, I think so. Hmm. Now... Um, as we're going on about this, uh, one thing, uh, Anthony, you're getting a lot of feedback on your microphone. Apparently, let's see if it, it's not happening now. I'm getting it, it good now, but just, just a heads up. Um, what got you into artillery itself? Is there uh, something that kind of sparked that interest for you, or how did that really start? I had I had an ancestor that fought. That well, it's at, let me say it this way: he he was at Antietam. He was in Battery M, First New York Light Artillery. It was George Cothran's battery uh, from Western New York, which is where I'm from. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is he arrived the Monday after the battle, so he didn't fight at Antietam, but he was with the battery for the rest of the war. And I got his pension records, and he sure enough was at Chancellorsville and Gettysburg, and oh, wow. this was a 12th Corps battery, so. They went out west. They became the 20th Corps, and he followed Sherman through Georgia all the way to the Carolinas. So he had quite a long uh, Civil War journey uh, in his day. Um, and then I've had several other ancestors going all the way down to my dad, who was a artilleryman in the uh, in World War II out in the Pacific. So I, I, I guess maybe artillery is in my blood to some extent. But I've, I've just I've just been interested in that neglected you know, combat arm. There's there's cavalry well treated. There's infantry definitely well treated, mm -hmm. but artillery never got the look I think that it needs, and mm -hmm. so that's really how I got interested in and into it. No, and, and I'll I'll agree also, with you. I'm also a, a Antietam has a volunteer artillery detachment, Battery B, Fourth U.S. So I've been with them for a long time, and I've done some artillery with other units uh, that actually have horses. Uh, Burroughs Battery from Tennessee. I was with them during the 150th for Appomattox and a great bunch of guys with that organization as well. So sure. really, really got interested in artillery. Oh, and that's artillery. I agree with you is probably the most underrated arm of the entire civil war. It is an outfit that is, you know, given a little bit of scholarship here recently, of course, your book adds so much to that field of scholarship that we've been lacking in. Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've read uh, recently to Earl Hess's book about artillery. I thought that was rather good. It gave a, yep. a good yep. introductory and then it can get really bogged down for a lot of folks. But, uh, you know, me and you, we were big in artillery. So to be able to read something like that, that was a huge eye opener. I think there was more to it that I didn't really understand. I mean, when we talked about horse drawn artillery, how that worked, uh, just even down to the different implements that were used, different guns that were found and used, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the, yeah, it's artillery is definitely, I think, one of the most underrated and it gets yeah. almost glossed over a lot, even though it's it's sometimes decision making in battles. You know, artillery can really make or break the fight. So it, it definitely deserves more attention than it has been given in previous years. Yeah. Yeah. Deserves Absolutely. some love. Yes, it does. So in writing this, uh, did you you didn't start this during the pandemic, did you? Well, actually, I began researching a book on the regular artillery, the U.S. batteries. There were 20, 21 or 23 of them at Antietam. And I spent a long, I used, when I was still working downtown, mm. the archives was right down the street. So I would go down there on my uh, lunch hour and on my off days. And I started to accumulate every single one of the uh, monthly returns. A monthly return would basically give you the numbers and a little description of what it did. And there were there were five artillery regiments in the US. Uh, there were twelve batteries in each regiment. That was two batteries. I basically I basically created a database for all sixty batteries from December eighteen sixty to May of nineteen eighteen sixty five. So every every battery every month for the entire war and, and I initially was just gonna go in that direction. Mm -hmm. with a book on that. Uh, and then we got the Antietam Institute set up and we started with the brigades and then I started this. But I was uh, I was heavily engaged with this during COVID. Uh, yeah. Which, uh, which forced me to do something that all of us love to do and that's buy books. And so I bought 
every artillery battery history I could get my hands on. You know, the Virginia regimentals, those, those thin little white books, there's there's mm -hmm. a dozen yeah. or so of those on the Virginia batteries. And, and any any place I could find a battery history, and there's not a lot of them. Right. So I, I would accumulate those things. And then I just started to write, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, basically started with the, the feds. And then I went through the Confederates. And, you know, that's how the story went. But basically battalion by battalion. So in the Confederate Army, it's battalions in the Union Army. They didn't have battalion structure per se, but they had divisional artillery. So that's how the books organized. Okay. And I mean, you got to explain the writing. So you went to uh, the archives. You got a lot of your research material there. What was it like finally sitting down and writing this book? So it, this is a, you know, it's almost like I call it a baby because everybody's book is their baby. It's something they put a lot of time and effort in. A lot mm -hmm. of research hours, blood, sweat, and tears, you name it. Like, What was it like to finally see that cover come in when you opened that box for the first time? I bet that was one of the most rewarding. Experience. Well, I uh, – some of you know Kevin Pollack, right? Mm -hmm. Kevin Pollack is oh, yeah. runs publications for our institute, and we had sent the book off. We used Ingram Sparks, so it's kind of a self-published kind of an, a thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he dropped by my house. We did – They ran, he made, unbeknownst to me – he had one copy of the book done as a proof copy and he stopped by the house one day and handed it to me and was like, I was blown away. You know, I don't, I've never written articles. I'm not a, a, an article writer or anything like that. This was really, I literally just sat down one day and started writing this thing. So um, it's really my first writing effort. I, I had a blog a few years ago that I didn't really keep up on South from the North Woods. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also had a blog of, of, of Antietam quotes, but never s did any serious writing. And to hold that book in my hand and realize how big the thing was, too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you're writing, you don't know how big the end product's going to be. Right. And when you add the index and the bibliography and all the footnotes, uh, uh, it was really it was really very thrill. It was back in April of this year that I saw the first one. And thanks to Kevin for that. Yeah, He's a no. good friend. I've known him for many, many, many years at Antietam. Yeah, Kevin's an astounding historian, too. I, I really appreciate his amazing. insight when it comes to Antietam, too. He is. Uh, Timothy Wilging on Facebook mentions that when we're talking about elite units in the Union Army, I think the regular batteries are horribly neglected. Absolutely. And that may be my next project is, is, is again, if you look at those Virginia regimentals, those little white books, mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking maybe of doing one of those for each artillery regiment for the, for the whole war. So oh. it would not be, oh. it would not be a deep dive into every battle, but it would be the officers and, and, and the NCOs and where they traveled and when they moved around during the war and probably a little bigger than the, than the Virginia regimental books right. you know, because of the very nature. But, uh, I think I'll get back to the regular someday, and and like like he said, they are, they are the elite units, the the light artillery companies that the U.S. Army had before the Civil War. There were, there were eight of them, mm -hmm. and all of them were in Mexico, and all of them really distinguished themselves. And guys like Henry Hunt, and Braxton Bragg, and Thomas Jackson, they were artillery lieutenants in Mexico, you know, and yeah. so. That's another story that needs to be told is those all those other regular batteries out there because they they weren't just here in the Army of the Potomac. They're in the Army of the Cumberland, the Army of the Tennessee. They're down in the Gulf, Department of South Carolinas, all over the place. So their story needs to be told someday, too. Sure. No, I absolutely agree. Um, now, when you know when you go into writing these books and you do a lot of talks, if, if you have a talk that you prepare or you know, anything of that matter, have you found a favorite battery at Antietam or a favorite story that you came across in researching all this? Is there one that really stuck out to you the most? Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a couple of them. Uh, I'll share them, please. Let's see. He said George Thomas as well. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he, needs, true. he, needs, he needs some love too. <laughs> that's where the, uh, that, if that's where Tim's going with that. Um, Light Company I, 1st U.S. Artillery. Now, now everybody that comes to Antietam, and, and we we kind of interpret Battery B, 4th U.S., but Light Company I was a battery in the Second Corps. It was in the West Woods, and Lieutenant George Woodruff, so if you're a Gettysburg 
artillery guy, you know what happened to George Woodruff at Gettysburg. But Lieutenant George Woodruff commanded Light Company I, and 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 we don't call them Battery I. We call them Light Company I in honor of their pre-war status as a light company in the United States Army. So in my book, if you come upon one of those eight original companies that were light companies before, I'll call them Light Company B, 4th U.S., or Light Company I, it's, and so on and so on. But but Woodruff, Woodruff and that battery did a, a heck of a job in uh, the West Woods. And there was a lieutenant in that outfit. His name was Tully McRae. Uh, there's a book that was written, a, a bunch of his letters to his girlfriend. Um, and he said that we, I should find the quote, but he basically said that battery acted like a machine, punching canister out into the uh, advancing uh, Confederate ranks. So, so White Company I had a lot to do with stopping or slowing down uh, the Claws Division, Barksdale's Mississippians that are storming up the Hagerstown Pike on the west side of the Westwood. So Light Company I is a, is a very interesting battery, uh, has a lot of history before this. On the Confederate side, uh, there's there's some real cool outfits. By and large, the largest number of them were Virginia batteries. But there was a battery from South Carolina, Gardens Palmetto Battery. Mm-hmm. Go to Antietam and you go up by the cemetery. Uh, you walk through the cemetery and you kind of peek over the wall. There's two guns out there. That's the Palmetto Battery. And that's really? Garden commanded that battery. And Hugh Garden was describing the incoming artillery fire from the uh, Union guns position across the Antietam and the East Bank. And he said literally that artillery uh, rounds were falling on him from every direction but underneath. Uh, Mm. They got blasted. Uh, Not a lot of officers were killed at Antietam, artillery officers, but he lost uh, one of his lieutenants uh, there uh, at at, uh, at that location. Actually, only one battery commander is killed uh, in the battle, and that guy is a uh, commands the battery, uh, Gary Grimes' battery, which is in the Piper Farm Lane. It's a battery belonging to R.H. Anderson's division. So wow. he's killed. And then one lieutenant in the regular army, William Baker, in battery, uh, battery E, 4th U.S., Joe Clark's battery in the 9th Corps, is killed. So... Um, Interesting guys. I actually went up to Massachusetts and dug up everything I could find on William Baker. Yeah. Covered, there were newspaper accounts that covered his funeral. Uh, His father was a congressman. uh, Hmm. uh, Really an interesting guy. The the backstories on these guys are as interesting as the uh, action at the battle. And, And really, Really, that's what I'm about is telling the story of the guy, the, the men who right. were there. You know, the people who and not fought just, there. Not just the officers, but everybody. So, you know, in my index, if any artilleryman that I came across, he's in the index. So that index is a little fatter than maybe what normally some people would see. But if he was, if I found something on an, an artillery private, uh, like in Parker's Battery, if I, there's several of those, a guy mm-hmm. named Royal Fig. Yep, very Royal familiar with Royal. Awesome, on Parker's battery, uh, they're in the index, so you can find anybody that I was able to uncover. I I acknowledged, or shall I, we say, honored them mm-hmm. in the index, so they're in the index of the book. And I'm glad you brought up Parker's bag, because of course the uh, viewers that have been around for a while know that I have that, and you know, Jim, you and I have talked about this quite a bit. Um, mm-hmm. I have an ancestor that was with Parker's Virginia Battery uh, on September 17th, and he didn't really make it too long in the fight. Uh, now, he wasn't killed, but he was definitely wounded, and I still would love to. He keeps right. He writes about this ball being extracted from his leg, so in my mind, I'm immediately going to grape shot because when the battle opens, there is an infantry, in my understanding, in range to cause a musket wound or a musket ball wound or mini ball wound, whatever. So he's not able to, you know, really define what ball it was and in my mind i'm thinking you have these batteries over there across the antietam shooting into this position where sd lee's guys are at so he's probably taking grape shot or a piece of shrapnel and just calling it a ball but I, what was it like for the sd lee's guys because you know this is a story we talk about artillery hell you know the name of that book that we saw mm-hmm. earlier today what was it like just well for those guys to be standing on that ridge and, you know, and firing 
much is made and it should be made of the casualties in Battery B, 4th U.S. Artillery. They lost 40% of their men. They had 100 guys and they lost 40 guys. Mm -hmm. 10 of them killed, wounded, 9 or 10 killed, the other 31 wounded, and about 40 horses too. But Stephen D. Lee's battery, Stephen D. Lee's battalion lost around, and I don't have, let me see, I might have the number, I do have the numbers handy because I have the book. But they lost somewhere in the neighborhood of, like, standby. Yep. And Darren Weeks on Facebook says, good evening, gents. And Civil War Breakfast Club says, hi, guys. Hello, friends of ours. I hope you guys are doing well. Andrea echoes your sentiment, too, there, Jim. She says, 100% agree. The story of these individuals goes far beyond the battle. Their whole life story needs to be told. Exactly. That's totally correct. Exactly. So, Andrew, <clears throat> grab the book. So S.D. Lee's battalion lost 27% casualties. He had wow. 318 he had 318 guys, 318 men in the uh, battle and he lost 85. 27. Uh, I think Parker's battery may have lost near 30% of their men. And casualties doesn't mean killed, it means killed, wounded, missing. Right. So they caught artillery hell on that plateau and the author of that quotation is Stephen D. Lee. It is, yeah. He, he turned over command of the battalion to Porter Alexander. Porter Alexander took the battalion in November when Stephen Lee moved west. Mm -hmm. uh, he said Sharpsburg was artillery hell. Um, they were not only getting artillery fire from the guns of position, which were on the east bank, the uh, artillery reserve, but they were getting artillery fire from a line of federal batteries just north of the cornfield. Uh, oh, really? James Ricketts. Yeah. James Ricketts had two rifle batteries uh, in the cornfield, um, and uh, there was a Napoleon battery done by Ransom there mm -hmm. uh, that could reach out and touch the uh, Dunker Church Plateau. And you mentioned that canister fire or that that grape shot. Some of those, some of the rounds fired probably by those Pennsylvania rifled guns, probably were were a case shot. And case a lot shot. of people confuse case, case shot with grape. Mm -hmm. or canister rather because it, it has the same properties but uh case is an exploding shell versus canister which is turns your cannon into a shotgun that's an extremely right. short range cannon it's, so uh, it was I, you know potentially it shot by that. Case. yeah i wow. think that plateau looking north is one of the most important sections of any battlefield in america oh absolutely it's absolutely yeah. amazing well, anytime you can go you can visit as a visitor at Antietam and go anytime and it's absolutely gorgeous, mm -hmm. but also understanding that that one square mile going North to Poffenberger farm, just the amount of destruction that happened is just insane. It is. It's I got a question. I'm like, he, did, did your ancestor say that he dug the ball out of his leg or the surgeon had that happen? So because that you're talking a grape shot. Mm -hmm. If it exploded over top of him, it, I, I, I have a hard time believing that it's an artillery shot because See, it's just going to be coming at such a high rate of speed. It's just going to rip right through his leg. Right. And the thing, he gets it pulled from a surgeon in Shepherdstown. So he's able to actually evacuate himself <laughs> off of the field and go to Shepherdstown. Um, but he writes that it is a ball extracted from his leg. And uh, if you ever read, there's two accounts where I got not only his writing, but um, with, uh, Crick and Fig both. Yeah. Right, that Duffy didn't get any anesthetic. He was actually offered whiskey, but declined. And he, he claims he's a good Christian Irishman, so he can't take the whiskey. <laughs> so I'll take the water. And mm. dude, I'm sorry. If I have a ball in my leg, give me a shot of whiskey at least. Like something. I'm not taking water for that. Well, that, that intrigues me even more. Do you know where he, he where he was taken in Shepherdstown? I think it's the Methodist Church. I did a video in the church. He was, I think it's the Shepherdstown Methodist Church, if I'm not mistaken. So, so he wasn't featured mm -hmm. on the Emmy Award winning Ghosts of Shepherdstown uh, episode. Yeah, because uh, the the bakery. Well, he lives. Bakery. Yeah. Or the the front lawn of McMurrin Hall. So I got a question and a comment. Uh, S. D. Lee, right? <laughs> Artillery hell and all that. I think sure. he did a better job on the 30th of August, 1862, than he did at um, 
and Tatum, right? Because he's he's pounding the heck out of attack after it. Granted, he doesn't get beaten off that area at at Manassas <laughs> by uh, a whole bunch of big guns from the opposite side of a creek. But I mean, he's able to. I think I think he's, he's able absolutely to do it. wrecked at Antietam. What what happened? I mean, he got wrecked. He's getting wrecked at Antietam. Mm -hmm. But granted, he didn't have to deal with a guy like Porter. But anyway, so <laughs> Jim, have you? Do you have a favorite memoir related to any artillerist officer north south? Uh, because I, I just went searching around the apartment here. I found the only two artillery books I've got, which is this one for the Confederate. Uh, that's Confederate a good one. Is. Yep, that's a good one. Carter's Carter's book is good, and then Wainwright. Hmm. Uh, that is a good one. That yeah. is a good one. Yeah. The, 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 the sad thing about that book on Wainwright is what got left on the cutting room floor. Uh, I think Nevins, Evan, I think Nevins is the, I don't have mine in front of me, yes. right? Is that Nevins? Yeah. So if you read the forward or the whatever, Nevins said, there was a lot of other stuff that I cut out because it was artillery detailed stuff that I didn't think would be appealing to the writer or to the reader. Mm -hmm. So someday I'd like to go out to California where... Uh, Wainwright, I think Wainwright's papers are out there, and 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 maybe find some more good stuff. That that is a that's a great book. The book I was going to talk about, No Disgrace to My Country, is about from by John Tidball. Mm. Wow. Uh, it's a, it's it's written by a guy named Eugene Tidball, who I think might be a descendant. I'm not certain. That's a real good book too. Um, mm. But when you mention uh, uh, Wainwright, Wainwright's a character. Wainwright's a real interesting guy, and I would agree that's a great one too. And then Good I got one other one other question: If you were to pick on the entire battlefield or you know, a battery or location that played the biggest role for artillery, hmm. where was it, or which battery was it? Uh. I agree with Ezra Carmen. Uh, battery A, First Rhode Island, Tompkins Battery. Mm -hmm. Tompkins Battery is right outside the visitor center. If you look out, if you look out uh, over the uh, out of the observation room, there's two rifled guns there. That battery uh, affected the actions on in the West Woods mm -hmm. and in the Sunken Road for much of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, Part of the reason the Confederate brigades in the Sunken Road were not able to get up on the high ground, because I take people around uh, the Sunken Road and they say, "How come these, how come these Alabama and North Carolina guys aren't up on the high ground just north of the Sunken Road?" Part of the reason is Tompkins Battery at the Visitor Center is forcing them to stay in the Sunken Road. Hmm. Um, Carmen says that Ezra Carmen said that in his mind that battery played had the biggest. Uh, role in the battle. There's another battery that, that doesn't get the attention that it deserves, and another federal battery, and that is Battery C, 5th U.S. Artillery. They were located, uh, Campbell's Battery B is on the west side of the Hagerstown Pike, stopping Hood's attack, but mm -hmm. Ransom's Battery, done by Ransom's Battery, is on the east side, in the corn, north of the cornfield, and it only not only st uh, affects the attack of Hood's division, but it also halts or s helps to stop Roswell Ripley's brigade mm -hmm. and Alfred Colquitt's brigade. Um, and that battery got chewed up not as badly as battery B. Mm -hmm. right. um, I think on the Confederate side, uh, uh, certainly Stephen Lee's guns uh, played an important role. And we think of them on the Dunker Church Plateau, but after he pulled them off the Dunker Church Plateau, and reconstituted, he sent them to Cemetery Ridge. Really? So they were instrumental in the afternoon action on, uh, I call it Cemetery Ridge, Cemetery Hill, really where the Boonesboro Pike comes into Sharpsburg. Uh, they played a key role there. And that sort of underscores the ability of the Confederates, because they have field grade officers, and a field grade officer is a major lieutenant colonel or colonel, the Confederates have 10 of them, and that may still not sound like a lot of field grade officers, but the Yankees only had four field grade officers. And really? What's a field grade officer have? Authority to move batteries. When lieutenants and captains are, are, are stuck with that brigade commander, that infantry brigade commander, or that infantry division, 
in the Confederate Army, these artillery lieutenant colonels and colonels and majors like Lee, of course, moving under the authority of the other Lee, Robert E., uh, they're moving battalions all over the place. And so S.D. Lee's battalion not only is playing an important role in the Dunker Church Plateau, but also he's playing a key role on Cemetery Hill, slowing down uh, Dreyer's 4th U.S. Infantry as it's moving up towards uh, the center of town and also affecting the 9th Corps Advance Wilcox's division coming up mm-hmm. the uh, Rohrbach Ridge Road. So uh, those guys play a key role, uh, S.D. Lee on the, Union, on the Confederate side, Ransom and Tompkins on the federal side. Oh, good question, Anthony, and good response, Jim. Well, okay. Darren, oh, go ahead. No, please help yourself. Uh, so I – could you talk a little bit about Tidball? Because the, the national park there has a little trail or something that takes you to his right what, back behind newcomer. Yeah, can you can you speak a little bit about him and that sort of overlooked area? Right. So so John Tidball is a uh, regular army lieutenant uh, at the beginning of the war. He is in the second U.S. artillery, and so there were four U.S. artillery battalions before the war, and all of the artillery, let me call them philosophers, like Henry Hunt, William Berry, they came out of the second U.S. artillery. And so Tidball is kind of the next generation below Hunt and Henry or William Berry. And so he's sort of a protege of Hunt's. Um, and uh, Battery A, second U.S., was also a light company before the war. Uh, William Berry had it for a while. At the beginning of the war, Tidball gets it. He is promoted to captain, and so he commands Battery A. And Battery A is one of the first federal batteries that becomes horse artillery. Okay. So field artillery means there's enough horses to mount the guns and the caissons and the officers and the NCOs and a few other guys. But horse artillery means everybody's got a horse, okay? Mm. Which means what? A lot faster, can move around. So uh, there's four horse artillery batteries, uh, and Tidball's got one of them. Uh, Peter Haynes has got one of them at Antietam. Mm-hmm. Horatio Gibson's got one, and James Robertson's got one. Okay. Tidball, Tidball's battery is the first federal battery to reach Antietam on the 15th. Uh, it's basically pursuing retreating Confederates who are just slipping across the Antietam Creek to the east or to the west bank. And uh, really, Joe Hooker and Israel Richardson are leading that pursuit. And there's such a big traffic jam that Richardson's battery is way in the rear. uh, And Tidball happens to be close enough to the front. So Tidball goes up on the east bank of the Antietam and engages the Confederates. The next day, around 10 o'clock, Tidball moves across the Antietam with the other three horse batteries and supports uh, Pleasanton's cavalry and Dreyer's infantry. And the Tidball Trail, which goes from the Newcomer Farm up the hill to the position where Tidball's guns are, is a magnificent vista for, for really observing the central part of the field. When you're standing on the Tidball Trail or, or the Tidball position where those ordnance guns are uh, and looking uh, looking west, yeah, I think my I got it right. Looking west, you really can see what? If you look to the if you look to your left, you see the ninth corps. If you look to your right, you see the second corps. If you look straight ahead, it's the fifth corps. It's the one place on the field where those uh, those outfits, those three corps, are kind of moving forward so it's a it's a great location and it's a it's a neat hike uh the institute antietam institute our fall conference i'm going to be taking some folks up there and we're going to be talking about uh the artillery fight on the 16th which was something uh not inconsequential it had it had an effect on the on the 17th because the yank uh, confederates shot up a lot of rifled gun ammunition on Cemetery Hill, and that affected them to some extent the next day. Okay. Uh, Civil War Chronicles says hello from Civil War Chronicles. Hello. Good to have you here today. I, I could backtrack just for a second. We were talking about the horse artillery. So 
when we talk about the four that were uh, predominantly, obviously the union guns there and, and the horse artillery they have, is this something we could equate to what John Pelham's got going on with his guns? That who's going? John Pelham. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. So it'd be very virtually the same thing. Same. John Pelham, uh, Roger Chu, he had a horse battery, and uh, Hart. Is it James Hart? So Jeb Stewart had three horse batteries, uh, mm -hmm. and those were, the, and, but they had just really come together. They weren't, they were, the Stewart Horse Artillery Battalion hadn't been organized yet. Pelham's, it was called the Stewart Horse Artillery, but it was eight guns under Pelham. And right after Antietam, they break it up into two four gun batteries because Pelham makes major and a couple of his uh, lieutenants move up and take them. But yes, you're right, Tyler. That's um, same, same kind of outfit. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, I, I know that Pelham is down a few guns because by the time we get to Fredericksburg, he's obviously operating, I think, off of two. And one of those was a Blakely, mm -hmm. which is actually rather interesting to see that he had a Blakely with him there, too. Uh, Tim <laughs> Wilking, again, on Facebook says, James Robertson is incredibly underrated, a Mustang who performed exceptionally throughout the war. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. A, I like that. A, not a sergeant in the Mexican War in the Second Artillery. I think he was the the commissary sergeant, or the uh, he was he was a, he was a, he was a sergeant on the staff of the second artillery. He gets a he gets a promotion, uh, battlefield promotion, the second lieutenant. And uh, at the beginning of the war, he takes over battery company B. Was not a horse. It was not a light company, and that is turned into a artillery battery at the beginning of the war. A gruff, no nonsense New Englander. I think he was from New Hampshire. Yeah. Um, but he is also somebody that needs some more attention. Uh, like a, a number of your, uh, a number of our participants tonight are observing about the regular artillery. Those guys really were the backbone of the Army of the Potomac's artillery. Hmm. At Antietam. I'd like to get into them a little more than if that's the case. Uh, MJ, good evening to you as well. It's always good to have you in here. Anthony kept putting his finger up. He has something. Anthony. <laughs> Jim, so at... Second Manassas, the, one of the Confederate batteries, I think it's Riley's Rowan Artillery, used two naval boat howitzers that had been captured the previous year. Naval Were there any howitzers. of those Dahlgren howitzers at oh, Antietam? Okay. Good question. Uh, first of all, Rowan James uh, Riley, old yeah. Tarantula, that was his nickname. He was a regular army sergeant in the U.S. Army stationed in North Carolina. I guess he'd been there for so many years that he kind of went native. Right. And when South North Carolina seceded from the Union, he, he resigned from the Army. He was a sergeant. He became an officer, commander of that battery. Uh, I know it's had, a very specific question. He had two 24-pound howitzers at Antietam. He did? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. If, I don't think they were. Those were not. Those were too big to be boat howitzers. But. I think. Yeah, I. I know that a. Maybe I'm wrong, but I know that a Confederate battery had boat howitzers. I want to know how the hell they got boat howitzers. At Manassas. How would the Ports, they? The, the Portsmouth artillery had two naval howitzers. Was that they, it? They were part of. They were uh, part of Saunders Battalion. That was part of D H L or R H Anderson's division. That's right. That's right. So we okay. had naval yes. houses and yeah. those guys. Okay. Um, Anthony, send me a picture of those guns if you can. I'll, I'll show what their gear looks like. On uh, the Union side, really there were boat houses as well. Uh, Whiting's battery, Battery K, 9th New York, or Company K, 9th New York, that accompanied Rodman's division to Snavely's Ford. They also had naval howitzers. Because I know that there, there were two naval howitzers cap used by a New York regiment at Battle One. Captured by the Confederates, used by the Confederates in Battle Two, and I think and I, if I'm, I'm, my memory is jogging right, I think it yeah, R. H. Anderson. It was an artillery battery in Anderson's division that had them. Yeah, so that's very right, cool. And while I'm getting the boat howitzer up here, Tim asks a really good question, Jim. He said, "Could Jim go over the impact of terrain on the Ninth Corps after the capture of Burnside's Bridge?" Once Both we get a core artillery, artillery, that is. So we're talking about after after we capture the bridge, right? We're moving forward. Mm -hmm. That the question is okay. I think so, yeah, if I read that correctly, yeah. Could uh, after the capture of Burnside's Bridge, both core artillery. Okay, so after 
one thing about the Ninth Corps is the Ninth Corps has a whole bunch of, of different kind of guns. It has James rifles. It has the standard kind of guns. It has those boat howitzers. And so there are some problems with resupplying ammunition for those oddball outfits. The James, uh, Sam, uh, Samuel Benjamin's got the 20-pound Parrot guns, you know. So, th so they don't get as many batteries across the Antietam uh, because they're low on ammunition. They get, they get Clark's battery, Durrell's battery across. But if you're familiar with the uh, terrain on the, uh, on the west bank of the Antietam, it's a series of ridges that are moving, you know, gradually up towards the Harpers Ferry Road. Mm -hmm. You know, the Antietam's about 325 feet above sea level, Harpers Ferry Road's 550 feet. But it's not just one smooth slope moving up. It's a series of these ridges. And so uh, what the, the federal artillery has to do is it, it's got to basically limber up, cross the bridge, and then take position on these uh, intermediate ridges as they're trying to advance towards uh, Sharpsburg. And so on the southern end of the line, behind Rodman's division, you have a couple batteries, Durrell's battery and Clark's battery. Clark's a U.S. battery. Durrell's a... Uh, Pennsylvania battery, and you have Mullenberg's uh, battery A5th US, another regular battery that get across. Uh, on the northern, on the northern side behind Wilcox's division, you have Wilcox's divisional artillery. Uh, I think let's see, Asa Cook uh, is Massachusetts battery. Uh, but what the problem is is that Robert E. Lee is is assembling guns on the Harpers Ferry Road. Okay. Um, this is before AP Hill gets here. And so we are grabbing guns every, any place we can get them. Okay. Uh, some of the guns that were on the real ridge that were slowing down Richardson's division in the late morning, early afternoon, get pulled and sent south. SD Lee's battalion is reconstituted. It's put on Cemetery Hill. So some of those guns that were on Cemetery Hill can move south. So those federal batteries that are trying to come into position on those intermediate ridges are going to start to take a lot of artillery fire from the Confederate batteries that are massing up there. And Clark, Clark's battery in particular is, is hit pretty hard uh, by that artillery. That's Lieutenant Baker's killed. Captain Clark is, is seriously wounded. Sergeant, uh, uh, name escapes me. I'll think of it in a second. But an, an NCO's got to take over. A sergeant's got to take over that battery for the uh, for, for those guys because they lose all their officers. It's, it's, it's that hot a place. But the terrain does have a, a big effect. There's a cornfield down there. There's a 40-acre cornfield that's going to obstruct their view in some, some locations. And then uh, you're going to have what? AP Hill's artillery battalion is going to show up. Reuben right. Walker yeah. or Reuben... Uh, Reuben Lindsey Walker, right? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Guys. Reuben Lindsey Walker is going to show up with Willie Pegram's battery, uh, which is one of the batteries that gets up there. Uh, uh, the PD artillery gets there first. Mm -hmm. the Do they have Whitworths there. yet? Uh, what's that? Do they have Whitworths at that point? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Not, Not yet. Here. Okay. Um, but they're almost captured. In fact, they're, they're, uh, Tombs is trying to protect those guys as they come on the field. They, they get there ahead of the infantry, uh, and they basically have to pull back. But there's a lot more artillery action going on in the Ninth Corps area than people like to think, you know. Um, this is actually news to me as much as I've been to Antietam. Mm. I, I've never really... I've never even thought about it. Yeah, yeah, that the Ninth Corps had a sense. Oh, yeah. Tim, yeah. thanks for bringing that up, man. That yeah. was a good talking there, point. The, and, and, the, and the guy that nobody knows about is the Ninth Corps Chief of Artillery. His name is George Getty. George Getty is for Antietam was one of Henry Hunt's artillery reserve brigade commanders. The artillery reserve before Antietam uh, uh, had, was organized by brigades, and that structure would basically went away because the artillery reserve was so downsized to fill up the Ninth Corps. They didn't have enough guns to right. take North Carolina without any artillery, uh, and for other reasons. But anyway, George Getty is basically. I won't say out of a job, but he's this very qualified artillery officer. Mm -hmm. And so Hunt sends him down to Ambrose Burnside and makes him chief of artillery for the Ninth Corps. And so a lot of credit 
or a lot of the reason that the artillery is, I think, so well used by the Ninth Corps, first of all, in massing around the bridge and eventually helping to drive the Confederates back, and then secondly, moving on up to the uh, uh, ridges west of the Antietam and repositioning is due to George Getty. And you never know, you never hear about George Getty at Antietam. Uh, George Getty gets a promotion to Brigadier General afterwards and becomes an infantry guy who gets more fame as an infantry brigade commander in the Army of the Potomac later on. I may, he may have been a division commander, too. I'm not sure. So maybe a long, overblown response to the question about terrain. Hopefully that answered it. But uh, the terrain on the southern end of the field is much more challenging than on the northern end of the field. It's, it's much more... It, it, it's it's not nice general rolling terrain like you might see north of Route 34. It gets more sharp, you know. Uh, it's almost I call it, it's a roller coaster from east to west as you're advancing towards the Harpers Ferry Road. Okay. And uh, Jim, I went ahead and linked a couple of things here. Um, number Thank one, you. you know, we talked, uh, we haven't really brought it up in the podcast yet. The Antietam Institute, you know, you were able to publish this book there. I went ahead and put their website there in case any folks are wondering how they can support or how they can go on and uh, be involved with Antietam. So that website right there, uh, AntietamInstitute.org, which is right there on the screen. It Thank should you. be in your comments. So check that out. I also clicked a link and sent you guys the AntietamInstitute.org, the artillery units of Antietam. If you want to purchase Jim's book, Jim is just the best place to get it. That's a good place. The bookstore has it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's And you can get it on Amazon as well. Just a few words about the Antietam Institute. You know, yeah, let's you, talk about that. Gettysburg has the Gettysburg Foundation. They, they have a great organization of dedicated scholars and supporters that support preservation. They support research. And a few years ago, we, we felt, we decided down here in Sharpsburg that it was time to assemble a similar kind of organization right. that hosts some seminars. We have a fall conference and we do a uh, spring symposium. We have our books. You've seen the brigades. You've seen our artillery of Antietam. We have uh, journals, uh, scholarly mm -hmm. journals, who have come out a year. And we support preservation. We got a couple little projects. We've helped uh, uh, Burkittsville, which is where uh, Crampton's Gap is. Uh, there's a preservation society. We've got, supported them. We're we're in the we're not we're not a big uh, we're not a big heavy hitter yet like the Gettysburg Foundation, but. We are Getting an there. organization that uh, is really doing some really good stuff. And uh, anybody out there that wants to support the preservation scholarship at uh, Antietam uh, would be interested in looking into the Antietam Institute a little bit more. And you could certainly reach out to me as well uh, or Chris Vincent or anyone that you'll find when you hit that link over there. So thanks for letting us make a plug on that, Tyler. Oh, no, 100%. You guys do some wonderful stuff. And like I said, that battlefield, out of everyone that I have visited, I've grown up in Fredericksburg, so I have four to choose from here. I, I've been to Gettysburg more times than I care to admit. I go to Disney World at least once a year. It's the first year I actually skipped out on going there in the place of Antietam because, you know, hmm. that, there's more to the Civil War than Gettysburg. Antietam is definitely, like, top of my list right now. Um, so, so something like the Antietam Institute is absolutely near and dear to my heart, and I can't wait to be able to support and do what I can to help as well. So I wanted to make sure our viewers and folks on Spotify know that, again, if you visit AntietamInstitute.org, like Jim just said, you can provide some really great groundbreaking support by just helping out. Because right. this is new. This is an awesome organization that's really helping to preserve battlefield that, you know, it, again, Antietam is the bloodiest single day in American history. And it goes beyond that. We talk about the lives, the effects. There's so many good publications that are coming out about mm -hmm. Antietam right now. So it's hot and, and, and get in while like, getting's good. I would say. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, to we'd love this we'd love to have you join us. Absolutely. And then again, I have a link for your book, which if you want to help support, this is in my or my understanding, this is another great way to support the Antietam Institute is to buy it directly you. from them. Um, but also, yeah. if you find yourself at Antietam, go support Eastern National. Go hang into the bookstore and buy some from them because right. that money right. goes right back to the NPS, the people that are in holding of a majority of the Antietam battlefield. Absolutely so right. That's a great way to do that. Um, before we get ready to close out, we're at our 10-minute mark. Does anybody have any questions, uh, especially you viewers there on the computer? Type away now because we want to get Yeah, so I, I do have one question. Darren, uh, take it away, uh, buddy. Jim. So in your research uh, of uh, going for all these artillerists that you put in the index, did you come across any Brits? Mm. Mm. Because um, 
We well, I don't know if you call, call a guy from Northern Ireland. <laughs> Thompson, an Orangeman, commanded Battery C, Pennsylvania wow. uh, Battery C, in the cornfield. Mm, and wow. that battery commander was at the charge of the Light Brigade, Balaclava. Wow. He was an artillery sergeant in the British Army, James Thompson was. So that's and the Crimean, yeah. He yeah. immigrates to the United States before the war. And uh, he's got the skill set that the United States needs. And he raises a battery in Pennsylvania. And the only artillery pieces to go into the cornfield, to physically be in the cornfield, not north of the cornfield, but in the yeah. cornfield, oh, is wow. James Thompson's battery. And James Thompson was uh, a British artillery sergeant. Wow, that's excellent. Great question. Great so question. when you get back, we're going to have to go walk that cornfield again. And oh, I'm definitely exactly. doing that. Is that it marked today? Is that about. position actually marked? No, uh, there's there's two guns north of the uh, of the of that that are uh, Ezra Matthews battery, but mm -hmm. Thompson's battery actually goes over the fence into the cornfield with uh, Hartsuff's brigade. Whoa. Talk about having an artillery battery at your at your at your you know right behind you, but uh, uh, and that's the thing about artillery; it is a direct support weapon. You know, yeah, yeah, so yeah absolutely. You, you know, you you talk about artillery hell, but I mean that little cornfield literally had every artillery piece pointed on it. So how many did they actually have? You know, pointing on that piece of corn. You know, how many artillery? How many artillery pieces? Yeah. Well. Uh, I mean, it was horrendous, wasn't it? We 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 yeah. have we have the uh, SD Lee's battalion. Let's just say sixteen or eighteen guns. You have the first corps artillery on Poffenberger Hill, pointing towards the cornfield. Uh, I'm I'm just guessing right now, off the top of my hand, twenty guns there. You have the guns of position across the Antietam. You know, at fifteen or tw twelve guns there. You're talking. You're talking probably sixty. Guns. You just can't North imagine South how East, that must have felt. Southeast and West. Uh, there's also Jackson's artillery in the West Woods, and there's uh, the 12th Corps artillery, and there's mm. uh, there's lots of artillery firing into that uh, little 27. So, would the guns on Nicodemus Heights be trained on the cornfield too at that they point? Been, they would have been. Uh, they would have been firing on the advancing first corps coming out of the North Woods. Yes. Oh Tyler beat me to it. I was about to ask about Nicodemus Heights. Yeah, I was like, that's got to have some effect, too. I mean, because like he just said, north, right. south, east, and west. In, in the cornfield, you're almost just like in this encircled artillery Right, you're, position. Uh, you're, you're getting hit on all sides. I mean, right. that is hell, isn't it, right there? Oh, that's right. hell. And, and, yeah. just, and James Thompson, that, that battery took a hell of a beating in the cornfield, you know. He basically lost all the horses – Mm. All his horses are shot up. He knows they're dying, and he basically, you know, gets one final push for the horses to drag the guns out of the cornfield before the horses all collapse and die. And he had to abandon his guns. Now, they were never captured or threatened, but right. he had to leave his guns, go back to the caissons, and bring horses up from the caissons and mount them on the, uh, the limber chests of the guns to get his guns off the field. Good Lord. James Thompson, real interesting guy. Uh, AQ, our good friend over on Facebook, said, thank you, Unfiltered, for hosting. Great talk, Jim. Very informative discussion. Thank you. Tim it. also says, uh, James Stewart was a Scott. There you we go. You got that guy, too. Yeah, yeah. that's and true. He said, and took over Battery B, 4th U.S., when Campbell was wounded. He was also a former enlisted soldier in the battery. John Gibbon said, the finest artillery sergeant in the Army. Yeah. No kidding. Anthony, what do you got for us, man? I know you got some more questions burning. I was going to say there's any other Europeans hanging out there uh, in any command on any battery. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Because we know the 11th Corps isn't formulated yet, so you don't have a lot of the German battery. No, names they're, not, they're not. The chancellors will now. If you want to, if you want to count the Cajuns from New Orleans, there's a, a bunch of guys who are, are are speaking French. There's one battery, uh, the Donaldsonville Artillery. They're mm -hmm. singing the Marseille as they're swabbing their guns and shooting at the, uh, the Yankees from the Rio Ridge. Are they really? Wow. This is the real farm. 
that they're What's on that? the real farm. Is that where they're, they're on? on the real farm? The Donaldsonville okay. artillery. Yeah. <clears throat> no kidding. New Orleans guys. All right. Well, does anybody have anything else before we close out tonight? In the back of my mind, I'm trying to remember the story of the first shot of the battle. Doesn't it hit a hay thrasher? Something like uh, that? There's a guy uh, named Asher Garber, Lieutenant Garber, who claims to have fired the first round. And on the receiving end of that, yes, this round hit a thrashing or a, a thrashing farm machine that was in the Poffenberger yard. And it exploded and hit a number of guys from the Iron Brigade. Uh, and, and poor guys. Allegedly the first shot, yes. And poor guys. Anthony's deviating something that just, <laughs> I already know. I'm not even going to give it away, Jim, because this joke is god awful. But Anthony, is there some, there's so, more to that? Yeah. So okay. Anthony um, does a tradition for us every time he gets to pop on the unfiltered here. And he closes us out with what we call dad jokes. So you might understand or, or this Christmas too. cracker joke or Christmas cracker yeah. joke. So um, <laughs> okay, he has one. When I first met him, actually, well, I met him in a bookstore in Fredericksburg. When I started, you know, being around him more, he had just like let loose this barrage, if you will, of horrible gut wrenching jokes that just make you not want to even be in his presence sometimes. <laughs> I love him. Here's. Here's here's a bad one about artillery. All right, oh, okay. Let me, let me get the elevator music on for this, so we have some good background. <laughs> so, during the American Civil War, right, you had armies moving about, and you know, at nighttime, the, the all the campfires all over the place. You'd have campfires in the infantry camp. You had campfires in the cavalry camp, but you would go blind by the campfires in the artillery camp because they were the brightest. You know why? Because that's where the batteries were. <laughs> Bruh. Yeah, I think it's time to put us out. Oh, yeah, okay. coming in. That's the best joke you've ever told, hasn't he? It's, <laughs> not, it's the first one he's ever told. I've heard it a million times. I love that. Um, it's good. I'm going to nick I'll that. have to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> for the I'm use that when I go on reenactments. <sighs> But Jim, I wanted to thank you so much for joining on today. Um, MJ is even echoing our sentiments here, saying, "Oh Lord, <laughs> yeah." Yes, Anthony is oh, telling me God good. awful Christmas crackers. Darren, Holy. you've got one always. Do you have something for us, sweet? Um, I don't know. Well, I've been, I've been searching. <laughs> He's got a secret PDF on his phone of all these yeah, dad jokes. Real. Yeah. Like, so why does Santa have free gardens? Because he ho ho hoes. <laughs> <laughs> God, <laughs> I love this. But Jim, again, uh, thank you so much. And for folks at home, again, if you didn't catch it, this is the cover of his awesome, awesome book. I am, I'm very pleased to be able to read this and, and use this for the future. Every time I go to Antietam, this will be something that's in tow because I, I am an artillery nut myself. And this is where I tend to gravitate to when I go to battlefields. So to have something like this in hand while you're traveling a battlefield just makes that trip and your understanding that much better. Um, for those that are asking too, um, or wondering maybe, maybe I'm the only one that knows and cares, but the, the front of this, there's an awesome painting. Oh, I love that. The James Hope paintings. Uh, and uh, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't S.D. Lee's battery depicted on here? Yeah, S.D. Lee's battalion, yes. Battalion, excuse me, yeah, the battalion is on top of the ridge there. And Anthony had sent me these. I want to. Why were, they, why were they shooting in two different directions? I I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> oh, they are shooting it. Well, so I may actually have an answer for that. From my understanding, the Hope paintings are showing different phases of the battle in one painting. So when we go back to this one, I may again I could be wrong. But uh, and Jim, correct me if I'm wrong. Is there any? Point where the Confederates had to turn their guns to shoot at Union forces on this ridge. No, not not really. Uh, at first, when you started to explain it that way, I'm thinking if maybe they're trying to show later in the day when there were federal guns up there. You know, I don't know. Maybe, but they look but I don't know. great at me. No, that's a good Anthony. I've never even noticed that. I, out of yeah. everything that I've noticed in this painting, uh, but if you probably. Maybe you find that in Brad Gottfried's book. Brad Gottfried. Well, see, I asked Brad. 
I asked Brad about that, and he really doesn't know either. Brad did that nice book that you mentioned right. uh, about uh, the, the background of these hope paintings, and, mm -hmm. and he, he he doesn't know either. Interesting. So it's sort of a mystery why there's that random gun over here on the left just firing oh, in the opposite oh. direction. The, even mm -hmm. the caisson oh. and the horses are facing in the opposite direction. Is he related to Anthony? <laughs> Don't know. Uh, but the last thing we mentioned some doll green guns and uh, I have two pictures here. One I will show you one from the war to show you kind of what we were talking about when we met boat howitzer. So there's one there. It's a scary looking piece. And uh if you happen to find yourself at the Manassas Battlefield, don't mean to give it a plug here, but I'm going to. It's on Matthews Hill. That's right. There are two of them. Uh two of those would have been at first Manassas too, wouldn't they? Yep. Awesome. Well, Jim, again, thank you so much. Folks at home, I'm going to do it one more time for you just so you see it. Make sure to go on over if you haven't yet. Get involved with the Antietam Institute. And if you want some reading after this wonderful discussion, hey, there's a link here, the antietaminstitute.org, the artillery units of Antietam. Thank you. Tyler, do you, do you have something for your next episode? We do. Uh, tomorrow at 8.30, out of nowhere, Chris Mikowski and the Unfiltered Historian will be live. Uh, there will be a poster for it tomorrow morning. You guys make sure to tune into that one. It's going to be cool. We're going to talk about emerging civil war and kind of how that formulated, how that started, and just spend some time with Chris. He's a good buddy. So I'm excited for that. Very excited. And then you know, returns at the end of the month? It does. Scott Hartwig on the 30th of October. We'll join and talk about his new book. Uh, Jim, I'm glad I got to go to that talk with you. Uh, Jim and I actually got to see Scott yeah. talk in Antioch yeah. uh, on the 16th of September, day before the battle. Yeah, it was great talk. Yes, it was. Um, it was very informing, uh, it, very informative, actually. And, and just to hear Scott in person again. I, I haven't seen Scott since he keynoted at Fredericksburg the year I began interning. So that would be the winter of 2015. So it's been a while since I've been able to be around him and talk to him for a minute. Uh, so to hear him talk about that was cool. So we're really looking forward to October 30th. But Jim, you have provided an immense treatment on the Antietam artillery. We are very thankful for what you've done and all the work you've put into that. Again, well, folks, make you. sure, thank you. of course, uh, make sure you go over and grab that book if you don't have it already. Because again, it's, he's right. It is a reference book. I, I could front to cover this because I'm just like incredibly obsessed with artillery. But this, this here is it's cool. It's Good size, great, mm -hmm. great printing, great publication. Um, and you mentioned it was like from a self publisher almost. It doesn't feel like it. This has a high quality feel to it. So make sure. Yeah, you I, they did copy. a great job. With it. They did a real good job. Yes, they did. And I'll tell you what, it complements the brigades of Antietam very well. With the, the color, the size, it, it fits perfect. And next year, the commanders of Antietam. That'll be the third one. In the, that'll be the third one in the a trilogy. That sounds good. Ooh, I'm excited. That'll be back to a group effort. There's a bunch of us writing, like Kevin Pollock and me, and a bunch of other guys. Oh, and it's going to be super. Matt Borders, one of them. Is Matt Borders? That? Matt Borders. Is he one of them? Matt's Matt's writing. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Good Pretty deal. much anybody that you saw riding brigades was it makes another appearance in the end. Commanders. Sharon Murray coming back too. Sharon's probably, Sharon is writing on, I think, John Gibbon. Awesome. I liked her stuff in Brigades, and she was very cool to meet, too, in person. She's a great. Everybody at the Institute I've met so far has been nothing short, but yeah. awesome. Like, they're yeah. awesome. Yeah. All righty, guys. Well, we're going to go ahead and exit out of here, and we will see you guys tomorrow night. All right. Surprise. Thank you.